All right, so how are we going to move this forward into adults? I mean, we talked briefly about it before, but we need to get the, the adults can get ALL too, and clearly this is active. And they don't do as well. Uh, as they, they don't seem to do as well. So what, what is the long-term data with adults so far? Um, the long-term data, and it's come out from a number of groups. Seattle's a great group to, is showing this. Um, Sloan Kettering uh, has a lot of patients. The ongoing trials that are, are going, um, the long-term data is coming out. Most of the time it's been paired with transplant, and most of the problems have been with toxicity. So um, the ongoing studies, I hope, le will lead to, in the next one to two years, approval of this in adults. Um, We'll, we'll see as far as how long it takes to get FDA filings done with this. Um, but uh, I, I really think the solution for adults is the efficacy is there, and we know that. It'll get patients into remission, so we need to get them into remission with without high levels of toxicity, and we need to f figure out whether or not they need a transplant. I think the, the current furthest along commercial clinical trial is really the Zuma 3, right? Uh, it is. That was presented at this meeting as well. Presented at this meeting, it had a 72% response rate with a complete remission, and they had one additional patient who was uh, empty marrow, whatever that meant. Um, and so, so again, in a, in a very highly refractory population using a CD28 vector, uh, they can get patients into remission. The large majority of patients can get into remission. Um, uh, they now just need to make sure they're safe enough to get them to, to transplant in the case of uh, the Zuma vector um, uh, or uh, the, the other protocols that are moving along uh, with 4-1-BB vectors. We need to really follow them and see whether they have persistence in a, in a small portion of the population. My hope is, is that we've gotten better with more experience with diffuse large B cell lymphoma managing the toxicities of neuro uh, the neurotox, the CRS, that when we re-enter kind of deeper in and, and broader outside of, in multi-institutional aspects in, in adult ALL, that maybe the toxicity profile will change because we just have gotten better at seeing it early. I think it's already, it. it's already, it's already changed. happening, but, uh, but there are, you know, we were at a, at a, at a place where few centers were able to do it, and now it's going to expand back again to multi, multiple centers. Absolutely. Early on in ALL therapy, we weren't only just looking over the edge. We were leaning over the edge of the cliff, and someone was holding onto our belt before we gave anti-cytokine therapy. And now we're stepping back. Patients with persistent high fevers, patients with any lowering of blood pressure, they're getting uh, it, and it's, and it's helping. The profiles, people are handling it better. But do you think that the toxicities are different in adults, or is it just a continuum between the pediatric and the adult I, population? I think it's a continuum, but I also think adults are more fragile. Um, I think that, uh, 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 again, remember that m comorbidities and all sorts of challenges that occur uh, uh, with patients lead to more toxicity. So if you're in a situation where you have more toxicity, you're going to cause a problem. I think it's very similar to pediatric transplant. We can get away with a lot more because kids can, can right. tolerate it more. Also, one question is, is we change, if we change the co-stimulatory molecule, say from CD28, 41BB, or start combining them, do we need to be mindful of the lymphodepleting chemotherapy? Uh, because might we in, in sort of engender a more rapid rise and maybe more toxicity? Is right. that a concern? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think we got to remember that whenever we mess with our CAR T cell, it's a different product, and we need to be sensitive that it needs to be optimized for what it is. Yeah, I think that our group has shown that uh, pretty clearly just using one product, that the depth of lymphodepletion, the type of chemotherapy, the intensity of that chemotherapy, greatly changes the proliferation of the CAR T cells. Mm -hmm. And that the proliferation of the CAR T cells plays a big impact in terms of the toxicity, both in terms of cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicity. Interestingly, in our, in our previously published work, we actually developed a, a differential dosing so that patients who actually had more leukemia, we gave fewer CAR T cells to. Mm -hmm. And people with less leukemia, we gave more CAR T cells to. Because if you think about, I think if you think about the ALL setting, the uh, patients aren't usually given a lot of rituximab or anti-CD20 therapy beforehand. Whereas in the large cell lymphoma patients, these people are completely B cell depleted from, you know, from all their prior rituximab or other anti-CD20 antibodies. And so you can still have normal B cells in the ALL population that can still contribute, I think, to that CAR T cell expansion. So it's not completely clean, but I think we might find in the future that there is gonna be a variable 
uh, dosing where people with less disease may need slightly more CAR T cells. And the Penn group has shown that with, with uh, their vector as well, um, that split dosing may be important. And we have to keep in mind that uh, if you give someone um, inotuzumab, then you're going to wipe out their B cells sometimes for months. Um, and so you're, you don't want to take them to CAR T cells very soon <laughs> if they don't have any antigen yeah, to yeah. present. Right. So. so we think that there can be uh, CRS that's, that's impacted by the, the amount of uh, disease in the bone marrow than, or the amount of B cells. But we don't really manage it differently. I think the management is the same for people with CRS. And I think that this is really an excellent point that we have all moved our strategies up to where we don't wait until people are in the ICU on their third presser to then give them their, their you know, tocilizumab. Um, and so we're intervening much earlier in most of these patients. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.